Hello and welcome. I'm sorry I can't be with you personally today, owing to the industrial action on the railways, which has made it impossible for me to be in London. We have got indeed, though, a very interesting session ahead of us uh, to deal with warfare, and in particular, a book entitled Conflict, the Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine. And the two speakers today are the co-authors of that book, namely David Petraeus, who was the commander of United States forces in Afghanistan, and Andrew Roberts, now Lord Roberts of Belgravia, who has frequently written on military matters. So we have a great deal of expertise in between them to discuss this very important topic. In my place today, chairing the meeting will be our president, Johan Eliash, uh, and also General Sir Richard Barrams, who is a figure of uh, military importance in his own right. I will look forward to watching these proceedings with interest and I hope that we'll have other events in the future which I will be able to attend in person and see you all at them. Thank you. Without more ado, I will pass you over to uh, Johan and Richard to take the meeting forward. Well, uh, thank you, Michael, for that welcome message. And we're very sorry that you can't be here with us in person today, but very glad, thanks to the live stream, and the wonders of uh, technology, which not even uh, the railways could uh, ruin, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're able to take part nonetheless. So, as Michael said, I am Johan Elias. I am Global Strategy Forum's president, and I'm delighted to be co-sharing this opening event of the 23-24 GSF season, together with uh, General Sir Richard Barons. Uh, who will be taking over for the more interrogative part of today's proceedings. And he's a distinguished soldier himself. He was uh, Commander Joint Forces Command, and we're very fortunate to have him as a GSF advisory member. As many of you know, he has both spoken and shared GSF events on many occasions, and I'm very pleased that he is here with me today to co-host co -host the proceedings. So it falls to me to uh, introduce more fully our two very distinguished guests, which I do with great pleasure. So General David Petraeus and Lord Roberts of uh, Belgravia, Andrew Roberts, who will be talking to us about their new book, Conflict, the Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine. I was delighted to be sent an advanced copy. Unfortunately, I only received it late yesterday when I arrived to London, so I haven't had the chance to, to go it through didn't, it. But, didn't uh, stay up all night. <laughs> <laughs> Quite compelling yeah, reading. Exactly. What time did you get up this morning? <laughs> Very early, five o'clock. <laughs> um, so it's a highly timely analysis of uh, modern warfare from two leading authorities in their respective fields, and I'll get that. I mean, uh, most I know in terms of strategic warfare, I know from the great master himself who sits right here. Uh, so the book is for sale here today, and for those who buy a copy, it's a very good chance to get it signed by the authors. But let me say this, as the publication is not until the 17th of October. It's embargoed until then. And that means that this event is off the record until the 17th of October. And so no reference can be made publicly to anything said during the course of today's session before then. And I know you will always, as, or you will respect this embargo as you always do. Now let me turn to the introduction, starting with Andrew. He is an internationally best-selling historian and biographer and preeminent authority on global military history. And uh, many of us, I'm sure, have read his books. He has written 20 in total 
which have been translated into 28 languages, and he's won 13 literary prizes. They include The Storm of War, Napoleon the Great, which won the Grand Prix of the Fondation Napoleon, and George III. He's currently visiting professor at the Department of War Studies at King's College, and the Roger and Martha Mertz Visiting Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. So, Andrew, we're delighted to have you here today. Thank you very much indeed, Jan. Now, next, General David Petraeus. So he is very well known to the audience. And uh, yeah, Napoleon, the Duke of Wellington, uh, uh, Genghis Khan, and the great <laughs> David Petraeus. Genghis <laughs> Khan. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'll share that with my wife. <laughs> um, so David is a uh, yeah, retired general, widely respected as a leading war intellectual. He served for 37 years in the US Army, culminating his career with six, six consecutive commands, five of which were in combat, including command of the search in Iraq, command of the US Central Command, and <coughs> command of coalition forces in Afghanistan, following which he served as uh, CIA director from uh, September 2011 to November 2012. He's currently a partner and chairman of uh, the KKR Global Institute. May I so say so with a bit of inside knowledge, a very successful partner uh, and chairman within KKR. Everybody, everybody should be a partner in KKR once in his life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but not many have uh, the opportunity and the qualifications to become. The selection criteria there are very, 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 very tough. That's not easy. He's truly an expert military practitioner and strategist without parallel when it comes to modern warfare. And I'm lucky to have known him for many, many years, and he's a very loyal friend. And um, let me also say this, never try to do burpees against David. <laughs> many, many Navy SEALs and Delta Force have tried that and all failed. He's a true athlete on, uh, and keeps very fit. Coming, coming from a true athlete who still foreruns the downhill at Kitzbühel. When was the last time the president of the FIS did that? Well, it, it did never happen before. <laughs> <laughs> and, and stood up the whole way. Just, I, that's the real key. But as I always say, uh, the day in sports politics, it's, uh, yeah, every day is like a new episode of uh, Game of Thrones. So <laughs> what happens when I do that is that uh, you have thousands of people and they only wish for one thing. <laughs> that is to see me crash. <laughs> so no pressure at all. <laughs> now, just to finish here. So this couldn't be a more perfect pairing to collaborate on uh, such a topic. Conflict is a landmark exploitation both of global military history since 45, and of evolving nature, of uh, the evolving nature of modern warfare over the past seven decades to the present day, together with a look at it may evolve further in the future. So the format for today would be an interview style conversation for around 25, 30 minutes with Richard, and then followed by uh, questions uh, in person here and also for the remote audience. So finally, David, Andrew, thank you very much for being here today. I know this will be an outstanding session. And Richard, over to you. 
Thank you. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I'll freely confess to being under a bit of pressure uh, th this afternoon. A very large proportion of my uh, academic and professional military education training is sitting between me uh, and Johan. So, unlike most uh, book launches, I have actually had to look at the book uh, for this afternoon. <laughs> um, and uh, I think for everybody in this room, it, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating survey of things that are uh, common to us all. It, it doesn't uh, pretend to be an authoritative history of all warfare since the end of the Second World War, but it, it does take us on a journey from uh, the end of the Second World War and the idealism that, that came with it through uh, the decolonization of 1947 to 75, through um, Vietnam, through Sinai in the Falklands, 67 to 82, through the denouement of the Cold War, 79 to 93, that decade which they'll call New World Disorder um, of the 90s, which I know many people in this room uh, recall as a pivotal moment in their own um, service, and then, of course, into Afghanistan uh, and Iraq. And then it does two things at the end, which I guess is where... Uh, the eye will really fall for many people who read this book. It takes us through the arc of the war so far in Ukraine and tilts at where this war, which looks to be going long, uh, may take us. And then its final contribution to our education is it surveys how the character of conflict is changing, largely on the back of combinations of digital age technology. Not an entirely new subject to this audience, but expressed by two very distinguished authors in, in a way that very few people have captured um, so far. There are many conclusions in the book, um, but if there's one I'm going to draw out to get us going, um, it's this. And the authors say, the witness of history demonstrates that exceptional strategic leadership is the one absolute prerequisite for success, but also that it is as rare as the black swan. A sentence, if I could, I would have nailed it over the Tory party conference entrance uh, the, 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 this afternoon. And then the book asserts four uh, vital elements for exceptional strategic uh, leaders to grasp. And in the 20, 25 minutes I have, I'm going to work our way through as many of those as, uh, as possible. And the first is, they say, firstly, they, exceptional strategic leaders, they need comprehensively to, to grasp the overall strategic situation in a conflict and craft the appropriate strategic approach, in essence, to get the big ideas right. So let's start with a conversation about getting the big ideas right. I'm going to turn to um, Andrew first. <coughs> and the, 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 my question, I think, is can you cite an example from the book of where you think uh, there's a clear case of the, of the big ideas being got right? And might I ask you to take a tilt at how those lessons should inform our leaders today in this terse relationship forming between US-led liberal democracy and Chinese-led autocratic capitalism? Um, to take the first one first, I would cite um, the Falklands War. And also, if I'm allowed a second one, I would cite the first Gulf War as well. Because in both cases, with that of Margaret Thatcher and with George H.W. Bush, you had people who knew exactly what they wanted. Uh, with Margaret Thatcher, that the um, invasion, the Argentinian invasion of the Falklands would not stand. And secondly, with George H.W. Um, Bush, that the invasion of Kuwait would not stand. And so when you have that and you then have those decisions taken and you then hand it over to the, to the military, they know what uh, they have to do. And that is an absolute prerequisite uh, for, um, uh, for victory, in my sense, in my view. And when we think about our difficult conversation with China today, um, if you were advising Mr. Sunak, for example, uh, do you think that example reads across? Oh, yes, very much. No, absolutely. They, um, sending, sending messages to dictatorships is something that democracies haven't been brilliant at. Um, yeah. But when they, when they do it right, um, then it's very effective. It's terribly difficult. Um, and obviously, with the Cold War, we, um, we were all uh, indulged in as much criminology as we were able to. <laughs> and it's surprising, actually, how 
um, bad we were at it. Uh, it's, it's a very, very difficult thing to get into the mind of a dictator, uh, dictatorship. In fact, one of the reasons that the intelligence uh, before the Falklands War wasn't um, uh, able to warn Margaret Thatcher was because the dictator, dictators, the junta, didn't actually make up their minds to invade until about 48 hours beforehand. So it was next to impossible um, for MI6 or... Uh, um, other intelligence agencies to find out what was in the mind of the dictatorship. You get that again and again uh, in history. Let me build on that if I can. Yeah. But actually, let me just first of all say what a pleasure it is to be here, Johan. We've been trying to do a GSF event, I think, for two or three years. Of course, COVID interfered with that a bit as well, and it's really great to be on stage with you. I have enormous admiration for his business acumen. His, he's an entrepreneur. He's uh, you know, the owner of one of the great brands in the entire world of sport, uh, and then the leader of international sport as well. And uh, you end up having to be an international diplomat in that regard as well. And again, my hat is off to you. But really, this special place, in a way, and all the special people, frankly, so many of whom I've privileged to soldier with over the years or serve with in various capacities, ambassadors, generals, uh, business people, and so forth, it really brings home to me how special the special relationship has been in the course of my different careers and as a soldier, as a spy master, uh, even now uh, as an investor and an academic. And so thank you very much for that. Um, I think I'd add a couple of others very, very quickly, since we're in front of a British audience. Um, I'd add Malaya is another case uh, in which they get the big ideas just right. Uh, Oman, uh, you know, with the Sultan of Oman, but with his brigadier, uh, you know, who wrote that delightful book, We Won a War, <laughs> you know, modestly titled uh, book, Sir John Akers, who just happened to be the deputy Supreme Allied Commander of Europe when I was writing for the Supreme Allied Commander. And then, but there are also cases where we didn't get the big ideas right. Um, it took us nine years to get the inputs right in Afghanistan, much less that's not just the big ideas about how to conduct a comprehensive civil military counterinsurgency campaign, but then the right organizational architecture. It was very complex, NATO and US dual chains and so forth. Um, you had to get the, in, the resourcing levels right. That didn't happen until late 2010. Uh, and I'm talking not just soldiers, but also diplomats, spies, development workers, rule of law, all the other components. And then we only kept it right for about six months, and we started drawing down even when the uh, conditions really did not merit that, as you uh, will well recall. Um, and then, frankly, in Iraq, the surge in Iraq, the big ideas that galvanized, that powered the surge in Iraq in early 2007 were the complete opposite of what it was we had been doing before the surge. People talk a lot about change management in all these business books. Man, it doesn't get any more than if you actually reverse completely 180 degrees what it is you're doing. And I would contend that those big ideas very much were the intellectual foundation that we were then able to communicate, oversee the implementation, and so forth, uh, to drive violence down by some 85 uh, or, or 90 percent. When it comes to the relationship with China, I think there's a very clear big idea, and it is to be very firm but not needlessly provocative. Then you have to operationalize that idea, and among those would be to ensure that the elements of deterrence, which are twofold, there's two of these, it's a potential adversary's assessment of your capabilities on the one hand and on your, of your willingness to employ them on the other, there can't be any doubt about those either. And we have to be keenly aware that what happens in one part of the world and how we respond to it, Ukraine, uh, does influence perceptions of our, again, willingness to employ the forces, even as we're also transforming those forces to ensure that they are uh, adequate for the task of ensuring deterrence. So uh, again, you can see why this kept coming back. We actually had to sort of go back and rewrite the beginning of the book, because as we worked our way through all the chapters, we kept coming back to the importance of strategic leadership. You've talked about the first task, which is, again, to understand the context and, above all, get the strategy, the big ideas right. If you don't do that, I don't care how energetic, charismatic, eloquent you may be, you're building on a shaky intellectual foundation and it just won't work. So focusing on this uh, is something that we do repeatedly in the book. Um, and we. You can compare and contrast Zelensky and Putin wonderfully. It's a brilliant case study in great strategic leadership in the case of 
Zelensky, who's positively Churchillian, as the authority on Churchill has assessed, in <laughs> fact, himself. Um, but think of the big ideas. You know, the very first one is, I don't want to ride, I want ammunition. I'm going to stay right here in Kyiv. My family is going to stay here in Kyiv. All men in Ukraine are going to stay in the country, and then on uh, from there. And again, really quite extraordinary. And of course, you always need, you need the civilian strategic leader, the George H.W. Bush, who says in the first meeting where the military was pretty equivocal about how we were going to respond to Kuwait until he says, this will not stand. And General Powell and others say, oh, okay, fine, I, well, that's very clear to us. We can, and then they operationalize it and did a great job because you need that military leader, uh, again, to, to take those big ideas and, and translate them, sometimes with enormous latitude, as we had indeed when President Bush decided to conduct the surge in Iraq and basically said, you know, go do what you need to do. And I now own the Washington piece of this war, having taken it over from Secretary Rumsfeld, to whom he had largely subcontracted it after making the decision to invade, and after some very flawed big ideas. Remember early on, Richard, that we decided that we would fire the Iraqi army without telling them what their future was and expect us to love us in the morning. And then we would also compound that by firing the Ba'ath Party without an agreed reconciliation process. We basically sowed the seeds of the insurgency with those two decisions, and it was not until, again, the surge in Iraq when we got a true reconciliation policy, that we were able to get the Sunnis back into the fabric of society because of these really flawed big ideas at the very outset after a brilliant campaign to topple the regime that was very similar to the, if you will, the brilliant campaign in, in Afghanistan, where a handful of special forces on horseback, CIA officers with money and warlords were able to take down the Taliban and expel Al Qaeda from the sanctuary in which they planned the 9-11 attacks. This is going to, there's some danger this is going to look like real, we rehearsed it, because I want to um, stick with this theme of communication. I assure you we did not. <laughs> we did not. There's far, far too many events to rehearse anything. <laughs> um, you, you, you say as the second of your four uh, precepts for um, exceptional strategic leadership, you say secondly, they, the exceptional strategic leaders, must communicate those big ideas, the strategy, effectively throughout the breadth and depth of their organization and to all other stakeholders. And I'm going to turn to uh, Andrew first here. So um, as a historian, you've written a great deal about that scene between political leadership and strategic military uh, leadership. Um, difficult to, to, to do well. Where can you cite an example of where you think that has been done well as a team and where not? Oh, I think um, a really good example for that would be in Oman, in the um, um, uprising in, uh, in uh, Darfur, Dufar, where in, uh, in the late 1960s, early uh, to mid-1970s, where um, you have the sultan, uh, Qaboos, who is uh, who first of all overthrows his own father uh, after being educated at Sandhurst. After I think being that's where they planted Sandhurst. the revolutionary Sen ideas. Sends his father off to live in the Dorchester Hotel for the rest <laughs> of his life, and um, and and revolutionises the um, the incredible um, societal and economic um, um, establishment essentially of Oman at the same time that um, this uh, brigadier that uh, David mentioned earlier, uh, Sir John Akehurst, um, did the military side and together they managed to um, to achieve something in, in putting down this uh, essentially communist um, uprising that was totally extraordinary. And though that's that's the ideal thing, if you happen to have a host country, essentially, where, where the leadership is, is, is far-sighted, hard-working, and, uh, and generally superb. This wasn't always the case, of course, in Iraq and Afghanistan, where uh, David had to work. So, um, I've actually wanted to ask you this question for some time, regardless of the fact you've written a book about it, but you, you led uh, the US-led surge in Iraq, managing that relationship between um, the, the Prime Minister and the US President, and then subsequently you led that evolution of the international campaign in Afghanistan in a very different setting. And in both settings you had to communicate these big ideas, but be very interested in your take on what was, what was different and what did you learn from the comparison of those two major theatres? 
Well, in communicating the big, we had big ideas about everything. And you may recall, we actually had a counterinsurgency guidance that I published personally, yep. that I wrote, and I was would revise it because you never, you're always revising the big. So again, the four tasks just up front, I know we'll get to the rest. You got to get the big ideas right. You have to communicate them effectively, again, through the breadth and depth of the organization and to all other stakeholders, which includes number 10, includes the White House, and includes, frankly, America's mothers and fathers and, and those of other coalition countries, too. You have to oversee the implementation of the big ideas. That's what we normally think of as leadership. It's the example, the energy, the inspiration, attracting great people, developing them, allowing those not performing well to move on to something else. It's how you spend your time. It's the metrics especially how you spend your time, because that, that nothing shows the importance of something uh, than you actually attending to it. So we had a battle rhythm that was very detailed. And then you have to determine how to refine the big ideas and do it again and again. And there's real formal process to this. And as you'll recall, when it came to, to the fourth task, we actually had events on my battle rhythm that forced the identification of changes that needed to be made to the big ideas so they could be communicated implemented and so forth again and again. Um, we had a big idea about communication. It was basically to be first with the truth. Um, now that sounds pretty obvious. The problem was we hadn't been first with the truth. We'd been first with spin. We had been putting lipstick on pigs. Uh, Iraq had been going terribly and we initially remember these were just a bunch, these weren't insurgents, these were dead enders I think was the term used by our Secretary of Defense who Insurgency was not a term we were allowed to use in that first year when I was a two-star there, you know, as you'll recall. And it evolved on from there. And it basically undermined the credibility of what was said, not only from the Pentagon, but from the White House as well. And so when we conducted the surge, we said we are just going to lay out the facts as objectively as we possibly can. But we're going to try to do it first. We want to beat the bad guys to the headline so it doesn't read, you know, Americans committed atrocity in Sadr City. It would say Americans conduct special operation in Sadr City and then the bad guys get there. By the way, the bad guys had CNN uh, field office in Baghdad dialed into their cell phone as well. So that was the approach. Um, it's interesting that not everyone found that easy. There was a particular uh, multi-star U.S. general who was the strategic effects leader who did, would do the afternoon briefing on occasion and on a particularly horrific day in Baghdad did not go out and say this was a horrible day. There were three suicide bombings in three different markets in which 160 innocent Iraqis were killed. Um, instead he went out and reported about the resumption of the soccer league and the swimming pools were coming along and where the water park was and then he said no by the way we had these three that's wrong. Uh, you got to go out and just say what happened, explain what took place to the best of your ability, uh, describe what we've learned from this and what actions we're going to take together with our Iraqi counterparts to mitigate the risks of it happening again. So uh, again, the communication component was very, very substantial. I also had a personal big idea, which was that you know it wasn't optional. Uh, for me. I, I, I did a whole briefing on this actually after the surge and it said it was, titled, it was titled Dealing with the Press. And the first slide said you can't win if you don't play and it had a bunch of happy things, you know, where I was on the cover of this or that and it was a nice positive report. Uh, then it said you can't lose if you don't play and it had a bunch of the ones that I wish I hadn't, you know, it's like the time that I said as a two star that I felt like a cross between the Pope and President uh, in an offhand moment to a Washington Post <laughs> reporter after we reopened an international border and had this great success. And of course, then the next day in the Washington Post above the fold, Petraeus in Northern Iraq, a cross between Pope and President. <laughs> it took me a few years to live that down with my West Point classmates and with the President. Um, by the way, I was just with, with President. The Pope, I, you know, well, uh, but anyway, so, um, but then it said, but we have to play. It's not optional. You know, uh, we owe this. America's mothers and fathers have a right to understand what it is we're trying to do with their sons and daughters, and frankly, a right to know a little bit about the guy who's privileged to command them. So this was the approach we took. That was not the standard approach that everyone took. Yep. As you'll recall, there were a number of our military colleagues who believed that the big idea uh, was, you know, never pass up the opportunity to keep your mouth shut. Um, <laughs> that actually doesn't work. Um, yeah. You have to be out there, you have to do that. We'd, you know, back in the day, we would come through London every single time I went back and forth to, to Washington. 
And I just didn't go to number 10, I'd, I'd go to RUSI, or I'd go to IISS, or I'd go to these other fora. Um, and we felt it was a very, it was an obligation, uh, and, and again, to try to lay out the facts as objectively as possible. Just a final note, uh, one of my great mentors, General Jack Keane, will be familiar with a lot of you here, and it, still a spokesman, a, a military commentator on Fox, and a highly regarded one, is a big mentor of mine. I remember he came out about five months into the surge. It was clear the surge was beginning to work. But, and he said, you know, Dave, you've got a, a public relations problem. And I said, no, sir, we have a results problem. And when the results are conclusively uh, demonstrating that this is working, then the press is going to discover it. We'll help them discover it, but I'm not gonna try to spin it to them. Yep. And that's what guided us as we went through that. The, the big differences between the surge in Iraq and so the four-star tour in Iraq, having had two and three-star tours there before, and then the four-star tour in Afghanistan, frankly, were the commitment of the United States president to it. Uh, president Bush literally went all in on the surge. Uh, the same could not be said of his successor when it came to Afghanistan. Yeah. So I'm going to permit myself um, to initiate one more round, which is on your third precept before throwing it um, open to the audience here and online. And your third precept for exceptional strategic leaders is they need to oversee the implementation of the big ideas, driving the execution of the campaign plan relentlessly and determinedly. And uh, Andrew, I'd like to take you to your chapter six, which is um, New World Disorder, the, the Balkans decade, um, because um, for many of us in the room, that was our first um, uh, big adventure after the Cold War. Um, you, you described that was a really difficult decade, humanitarian intervention in, into Bosnia, so um, playing amongst the symptoms of a war but trying not to get involved in its conduct or its, or its causes, the mixed blessings of lift and strike, um, the uh, efforts to make and police the Dayton Agreement, then the engagement into, into Kosovo on rather uh, different terms. And at the time, that felt like a journey of discovery and it didn't always go uh, well. I'd be very interested in and the lessons you draw from that decade for how we should look at the world now. And also given your, you know, your unique um, look into British politics, did it leave any marks on today's politicians? Um, well, needless to say, it's quite nerve-wracking trying to answer a question like that in front of Malcolm Rifkin, who was Foreign <laughs> Secretary at the, uh, <coughs> at the time. Um, but to, um, to concentrate on the, on the military side uh, of it, which is very much what our book is about. It's, it's not a political book. It's, a, it's about the evolution of, uh, of, of yeah. military um, affairs. Um, one thing that the Kosovo War did do, which might have been a... Um, a uh, cul-de-sac, essentially, was to convince a lot of senior people in NATO that you can win a war simply by bombing from the air. Um, the, you have some... By, in, the, in previous wars, only 2% or so um, of the bombs that landed were precision. By the time of Kosovo, that had gone up to 90%. And you therefore, of course, there were occasionally some terrible moments like the Chinese embassy getting, uh, getting hit. But, um, but overall, it did mean that NATO's air, um, not just air superiority, but air dominance, was able to, um, to force the uh, Serbs to withdraw. So people, uh, understandably, came away from that, um, from that experience thinking, right, we don't need armies, we don't need navies, uh, th those are all things of the past, everything's going to be decided in the future simply by, um, by air power. And that, of course, uh, turned out to be wrong. You know, I'd just point out very quickly that what's often overlooked about Kosovo, and I know that Paul Gibson's here, who was the MA to Charles Guthrie at the time, I was the, uh, the PSO, I think you would call it here, yeah. uh, to General Hugh Shelton, who was a great partner with, uh, with Lord Guthrie. Um, is that what ultimately really brought that war to a close was when we were able to really clobber the Serbs for the very first time when they were forced to mass against the Kosovar Albanians ground force, which again, because it was not NATO, is often overlooked. Uh, and they came pushing up from uh, Albania and again forced the Serbs to actually have to come together for the first time and we could truly bring our air power to, to bear in a very decisive way. 
which was not the case prior to that. In fact, I remember General Guthrie and uh, my boss, General Shelton, uh, somewhat very concerned, actually, about the direction of the air campaign. And as Gibbo will recall, we actually went together. I think it was the quad chads, as we called them, the US, yeah. UK, uh, French, and German chads, maybe the Italian as well, to SHAPE headquarters and sat down and had a bit of a more than a tete-a-tete -tete with the Supreme Allied Commander at the time, uh, who had thought that Milosevic would cave within a day or two of this bombing. Uh, and to our dismay, uh, we found that that was not the case. And, and my boss had actually predicted that. Uh, we'd literally run out of targets, as you may recall. And so yeah. we had to go back to the same targets. It was called making the rubble bounce. We'd already hit all these barracks, and so we hit them again until we could generate additional targets because of the assumption that had been made by the field commander uh, that Milosevic would, would surrender very quickly. He did not, and it went much, much longer than that, as you'll recall. Yeah. So finally from me, General, mm -hmm. um, there's a wonderful line at the end of chapter nine, which is about Putin's existential war against Ukraine, which you quote from a Colonel Joel Rayburn of the US Army. Mm -hmm. And he says of the Russian military, a bad army was ordered to do something stupid. And uh, it's President Putin's birthday on Saturday. And his strategy appears to be based on just out-suffering the West it does. and hoping for the right outcome from the mm -hmm. US presidential election yep. uh, next year. So what I would ask you to do before I throw it over to the wolves here is um, what should NATO now be doing to um, execute the campaign plan around Ukraine relentlessly and determinedly? Well, it should, it, it actually, I think we've been very clear about this. Um, and Secretary General has done a magnificent job. One of the reasons he's been extended year after year after year, I think he will ultimately be the longest serving Secretary General in NATO history, um, which is to continue to support Ukraine in every way possible uh, to enable them to convince Putin that he is not going to be able to outsuffer the Ukrainians, the Europeans, and the Americans and that not just on the battlefield, but also at home with his economy because of the economic, financial, and personal sanctions and export controls, uh, that this war is not sustainable for Russia in the same way that at a certain point, Afghanistan was not sustainable yeah. for the Soviet Union, noting that many, many times Russians have been killed in Ukraine that were killed in, in, in the first 19 months that were killed in nearly 10 years of war in the shadow of the Hindu Kush. Um, and again, you can break that down into more specifics. They clearly just need, there's an insatiable appetite for artillery munitions, for rockets. We should make the decisions more rapidly. The UK, by the way, has led the way in many cases. The most recent, of course, is with Storm Shadow. US still has not provided the equivalent of that, the Army Tactical Missile System. I hope we will <coughs> shortly and it'll be the version that has the cluster munitions because they could be particularly effective against some of the targets that are a bit beyond the reach uh, of what we've provided so far. But think about the decision on tanks. It was delayed far too long, the decision on Western aircraft. Again, these were inevitable decisions. There are no more MiG-29s anywhere in Eastern Europe uh, to give to Ukraine. Yeah. They've all been refurbished and provided to them. You had to shift to Western aircraft. I'm ambivalent whether it's the Gripen or the F-16. F-16's ubiquitous, okay, provide that, um, even though the Gripen might be a bit better for the rugged runways of, of Ukraine. But let's make those decisions. Yeah. So we're on the one hand, uh, and by the way, I'm truly non-political in the US. I don't even register to vote, much less vote or, or support candidates. But I do advise members of either party who do seek out uh, my thoughts and so forth, and members in the White House. Um, and I think they've done a magnificent job, actually, in leading the Western effort together very much with the UK, which again often was a bit ahead of the US and, and walking point for the alliance effort. Um, $44 billion is a massive quantity. I mean, this is 10 billion more than the annual Italian defense budget, for goodness sake. Uh, so it's extraordinary, but some of these decisions have lagged, and that's uh, something that I hope we can do better uh, in, as even as we continue to rely more artillery, more air defense, more rockets, more missiles, get the Western aircraft in there, get the tanks on the ground, yeah. and all the rest of this. Again, this is clearly going to be a marathon, not a sprint. The Ukrainians are incredibly admirable in so many different ways. Andrew and I visited 
about four months ago. I was just back there again about three or four weeks ago. But at the end of the day, uh, we have to continue to support them or they will not be able to sustain yep. this effort. It is uh, encouraging, frankly, and there's some people with whom we're doing the numbers to, to assess that we believe that the Europeans now have done more, at least in terms of pledges, not just of economic, financial, and humanitarian assistance, which is very clear, but when it comes to actually security assistance, uh, we think that it could be somewhere in the neighborhood of 46 to $48 billion relative yeah. to the US $44 billion. So uh, again, we just have to maintain the support for the Ukrainians in all different respects. Yeah. And it's not just that which helps them succeed on the battlefield, That's, that is paramount, but it's also tightening the financial, economic, and personal sanctions and export controls. And now it's also sanctions enforcement because there is sanctions evasion that's ongoing. And you'll have seen that the US, for example, sanctioned about 150 companies uh, a few weeks back, yeah. that we all need to do that uh, much more rigorously. Andrew, you wanted to add? Yes, just to add that one of the big um, messages of this book is how important morale is in uh, in warfare. Not just the military morale of the soldiers, but uh, but um, political morale, morale amongst the public. And um, when we visited uh, Kiev, we came away with a strong. Uh, sense, didn't we, David, that um, Ukrainian morale was incredibly high, considering what the, the, the horrors that they have uh, uh, faced. We went to Butcher and Irpin, you know, we were under no illusions about the level of war crimes that uh, the Russians are um, guilty of. But nonetheless, the, um, the morale amongst not just the ministers and the generals who we spoke to, but everyone we spoke to, was uh, truly extraordinary. Mm, interesting. So, Linda, we're going to throw it open to the floor. If you are online and you would like to ask a question, please type it and it will appear on the screen and I will read it out. But who would like to start here? There's a lady just in the third row there. Jacqueline's going to produce a... To your right. There we are. Madeleine Mook, uh, former president of the NATO Parliament. You talked about morale and you talked about truth. And, Richard, you talked about the real importance of a clear message. How do democracies get clear messages and truth and ensure that democracy survives when disinformation is current throughout our politics and from our leadership? I am deeply worried about that across the political parties what are the messages that you would see that are essential? Because the public is not seeing any difference between political disinformation coming from China, from Russia, from North Korea, to what is coming out of the mouths of their own politicians. How do we deal with that? You have uh, honest messages delivered by credible messengers. Um, and again, that's not easy. Uh, especially in a world, you know, I think you very much have that challenge here, but we have it even arguably a bit more in the United States where you have news channels that are very, very clearly in one camp or even in one person's uh, camp uh, and then on the other. Um, I'm on the speaking circuit in the U.S., and I will occasionally note that I can tell within about three or four minutes if they only watch this network uh, <laughs> because of certain key phrases that are, are used. Uh, and then it takes me about five or six minutes if they only watch the other network. Um, but no, it's, I think it's actually the central issue of the day for democracies. And again, the election next year in the United States will have a tremendous amount um, to do with that and about that, um, depending on, again, which candidate, which party, and so forth. Uh, but again, you, I think you have to have really, really credible figures. That's very difficult both to find and to maintain, uh, because there's going to be no end of detractors and people chipping away at them and arguing. And then you have to deliver the facts, and you have to also try to convince people that there truly are facts, there really is still truth, um, 
and you know, it's not all, all fake news, if you will. And another problem that we go into in this book, especially in the last chapter about the future of war, is um, the whole issue of uh, deep fakes and um, the way in which uh, um, technology is advancing has become, it has become so much more difficult to tell the, tell the truth, certainly with photographs and videos and, and uh, recordings and so on, that this is a problem that's only going to uh, get worse. Wait until you have AI that is actually, so you know, the way you answer this issue is you have people that are, you have a war room of you know, people watching, listening, uh, reading what's out there in all the different media um, and responding to it real time. Imagine what happens when it's machines that are responding to it and making it up based on algorithms or guidance given by humans and how difficult that will be to contend with. You know, when we were doing the surge in Iraq, I had a war room uh, together with the U.S. ambassador and the, the Brits, uh, which was basically watching all the, the Iraqi TV channels, listening to all the radio, reading all the print media. We really didn't have that much in the way of uh, websites in those days. But again, every single uh, means of communication with the uh, Iraqi people uh, and with others, but mostly with Iraq, and then responding to those real time, because once again, we wanted to be first with the truth. You gotta beat the bad guys to the headline, but you have to do it with the facts as you know them at that time. And if they change, if you get new information, you know, the first report is always wrong and all that, mm -hmm. then you update it as rapidly as you can as well. So, gentlemen, second from the end, row two, and then we're gonna come to the side of the house. Lady, right at the back. Thank you very much. My name is John Dobson. I write for the Indian Sunday Guardian. Um, I promised to be quiet for two weeks about this book. Um, I wonder if you could um, make a comment, please, on something which has fascinated me for some time, and that is the leadership qualities of Yevgeny Prigozhin and the role of private armies in the future. That's one for you. Well, first of all, the private armies that you see in, in particular, the, uh, what Prigozhin had, the Wagner Group, really doesn't have a parallel in the Western world. Um, we, don't, we have private security companies, lots of them. In fact, it was a British security company that I contracted out my security as a three-star because there weren't, uh, we only had one military police unit, uh, and I wanted them to protect all the other folks that didn't have anybody to protect them because I could hire security and we did and it was great. But they did not carry out offensive operations. All of their rules of engagement were strictly self-defense. Uh, what the Wagner Group would do, was doing, particularly in places like Syria, Libya, various locations in West Africa, uh, was very much offensive uh, in, in nature, uh, also very corrupt in nature. And again, it's just not the kind of thing that we would do. The other issue is that I, I literally don't think we could hire people like this in sufficient number, um, given the expense of the really kinds of competent individuals that you would want and all the other ancillary expenses around them, nor could you probably find people that would raise their hand to, to, to do that. You know, do you really want to give your life for, I don't know, Blackwater or Son of Blackwater or whatever it is, uh, and so what you had was something that was very unique. It's very useful to Russia. I think one of the reasons that it took so long for Prigozhin to fall out of a window or get jabbed by an umbrella on a Sunday day or as it was <laughs> a, being a plane that gets blown up, uh, supposedly with explosives that were put on with a case of wine or something, was because Putin was trying to give the foreign ministry and the, and the Ministry of Defense in particular an opportunity to figure out what are we going to do to replace the Wagner Group if indeed its leader and its deputy both go down with the plane, as was the case. Uh, and they literally had started to, to establish other private security companies in case they needed those, although it now appears that it may be that Wagner may in some fashion uh, still stay somewhat intact, particularly when it comes to the African. In fact, the latest report is that his son might actually be the one who takes over at least part of this, while the others are signing on the Rus with the Rus Guardia, which is the National Guard of Russia, but will be used back in Ukraine. I think they're getting desperate again in Ukraine, where they can't find enough reserve forces uh, to plug the gaps that are being uh, gradually chipped away 
in this very substantial defensive uh, set of belts in the southern part of Ukraine. I think another um, reason why the West wouldn't be able to do this is that it would be very difficult to get the Lord Chief Justice to allow the prisons uh, to, <laughs> the sweepings of the prisons uh, to be uh, sent off into any mercenary group in, uh, in Britain. I think that she might have something to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Lady right at the back. Thank you, this is Jane from the European Leadership Network. You both mentioned Kuwait as a clear-cut example of victory which is quite right, but of course, the loser in the conflict, Iraq, remained a locus of instability for a very long time. And I'm curious with Ukraine, sort of how you envisage or might envisage a big idea for Russia after this war. It seems like NATO members are quite divided about whether you know, Russia has to be humiliated, uh, maybe even dismembered or whether it has to be brought in in some way to European security. How can we think about this? Thank you. Well, having taught economics uh, in an earlier academic life, I learned that you can never go wrong by starting an answer to such a question by saying it depends. Um, and it does depend. I think it depends an awful lot on how does the war end, what is Russia's posture, how does it, does it help bring about the end, and you know, it, having been so brutal and uh, so horrific in what it has done. I mean, it's a, this, this is an army that has a culture of committing war crimes rather than trying to avoid them and observing the Geneva Convention. Uh, and then it depends on what happens in domestic Russian politics. Um, it's hard for me to believe that there will be an embrace of Putin if he remains on the throne. Um, and how long will it take Western companies to be able to justify going back in there, if at all? Uh, so I think, you know, the, the challenge with Russia, frankly, has been that it has minerals and resources, energy, that the rest of the world still needs. And that the rest of the world is actually somewhat ambivalent about how much do we clamp down uh, on their export of, of crude oil in particular uh, if it drives up the price of gasoline at a pump in the United States uh, a year before the, the election. So we have all of these challenges. Uh, that exist. You know, it's said that, um, I think you didn't say it, Malcolm, but, it, but you, you would have. It's a great saying, you know, Russia is a gas station with guns or a gas station with nukes. Um, and that's what's made it so formidable, frankly, it is the amount of crude oil in particular, but also natural gas, coal, other strategic minerals, agricultural products, and all the rest of this. And the world needs a certain amount of that. And we can't deny a certain amount of that to the world. And by the way, there are countries that even if we sought to deny it, we'd still buy it happily at a discount. Um, so again, I think it very, very much depends on what ultimately brings this to an end. Uh, is it actually initiated in some way by a Russia that says, OK, you're right, this is unsustainable. We need to get back into, the, into Europe, if you will. We need to get back into the, uh, you know, the, the nations of the world, not just those that shun us now. Uh, if, and if there's a new leader, but the problem is that you know many of the assessments of who might replace Putin certainly don't envision um, a Jeffersonian Democrat riding in on a white horse to the Kremlin. Uh, they envision someone even worse, perhaps, than Putin, because that's what will be required at that moment to keep the Federation together and all of its sprawl and different uh, ethnicities, religions, and, and so forth. So again, I think it's very, very hard to try to, with any precision at all, to predict what that might be, other than to list the conditions on which it depends. I haven't got anything to add to that. I agree with every word. Malcolm. Malcolm. Uh, we're going to need the microphone for the it's approaching <coughs> rapid. Malcolm never needed a microphone. Come on, what are you talking about? <laughs> uh, you began, particularly you, Andrew, by emphasizing the need for strategic leadership at the beginning of a political crisis of that kind. But it's significant to the two examples you gave where it, worked, where it existed was the Falklands uh, and um, well, the, Falklands the Gulf. Was one, the Gulf. And the second was the Gulf. Gulf. Gulf War. Gulf the War. Gulf War, yes. And in both cases, it was perfectly obvious what the strategy should be because you either liberate the islands or you don't. You either give Kuwait back its independence or you don't. And if you haven't, you failed. But surely there's a slight risk in putting too much emphasis on what we call strategic leadership, because most of the international conflicts are not as clear-cut. 
uh, when we decide to intervene in Afghanistan or Iraq or the Bosnian conflict of a different kind, you can declare something you call a strategy, but you really don't have the faintest idea how that's going to work out. And you cannot measure success or failure in the way that you could for the Falklands uh, or uh, Kuwait. So is it not best not to avoid a strategy? I, I'm not suggesting that for a moment. But you've got to ensure that the political leadership start. is not so committed to a declared strategy that it feels uncomfortable about showing flexibility when events have moved in a slightly different way to what you anticipated, which in fact is what exactly happened in Afghanistan, in Iraq, uh, and elsewhere. I, I was going to start, and then I'm going to hand off to somebody who actually is in a, in a house here, uh, in the upper house, obviously, of your parliament. Um, with respect, it actually was not clear when George H.W. Bush sat down at that first National Security Council meeting and immediately said, this will not stand. If you read the history of the inclinations of the senior military, General Powell among them, um, you, you, re you recall that they were very, very burdened by the lessons of Vietnam. And they'd actually established all these different conditions that had to be met theoretically. And they were called the Weinberger Rules, although the senior MA to Weinberger was none other than Colin Powell, then it was Powell's Rules. The truth is that most of these rules were unattainable. There's just no way you can truly meet all, you know, it had to be, uh, we have to have very clear political objectives that can be achieved. It has to be a short war, it can't be, you know, all these different things that again, um, if you had that kind of clarity, uh, it would be very, very rare. And the truth is that again, they weren't chomping at the bit to deploy to the Gulf and to ex expel Saddam Hussein. In fact, you'll recall that we weren't sure we could even get into the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. They had to dispatch a, a, a delegation led by the Vice President right away that sought to convince the King that they should actually allow Americans and, and coalition members onto their soil, which they were not all that keen to do. Um, so again, with hindsight, that appeared painfully obvious, you know, and to the uh, casual observer, as they say, but it was not at the time, actually. But then I'll give the tougher ones to <laughs> Thank you, no, Baron, exactly. Baron no. of Belgravia. <laughs> um, no, well, of course, I agree with you, uh, Malcolm, because the, the more difficult, the, it, some of these are extraordinarily difficult um, decisions strategically, but what politicians mustn't do is overpromise. Um, and uh, and also sometimes to make it so black and white mm -hmm. that um, that they are essentially misleading their own um, domestic uh, um, public, and and you do see that, and um, and that's happened far too often, and. Um, and so there's a that, that is it's really the sort of test of statesmanship, isn't it? To um, to bring the, the nation along with you, not to um, to say that uh, um, you're going to. I mean, the classic example, of course, is Ukraine, because Russia will always be with us. You know, even if you say um, that uh, Russia must be expelled from the Donbass and uh, the Crimea, that doesn't mean that there isn't going to be a massive Russia next to Ukraine for the for the rest of the future. So um, we can't make promises like uh, Putin will it be should be overthrown and taken to the war crime tribunal, although it would be wonderful if he were, um, because ultimately that's down to Russia. And as we know, Russia, with Russian history, it's usually palace coups that overthrow defeated leaders rather than um, the votes in the Duma. Um, so, so you're right. I think the, the important thing in a, in a difficult and moving and complex um, scenario such as you had to face in, uh, in the Balkans is not to um, overpromise. And, uh, and, and that really is central. Let me add to that because I think in a very concrete way, you know, don't declare red lines yeah. Um, yeah. where you're not willing to take action if the red line is crossed. That yeah. reverberated, that Syrian red line reverberated out in this what's that South funny, China what's that Sea. funny line of Mitch McConnell's that you... Well, there's another one which, you know, Mitch McConnell, of course, a minority leader in the Senate mm -hmm. right now, is famous for saying, never take a hostage you're not willing to shoot. <laughs> um, and uh, exa exactly so. 
But you know, there were there were others, and I experienced these personally. These the, the ones with Syria. I was the director of the CIA. We hear the President of the United States say Bashar al-Assad must go repeatedly. That is policy. And there's even more action taken to make that happen until all of a sudden the presentation is made at the situation room table and ooh, you know, really, we have to do this, we have to do that. Well, but again, your policy is that Bashar al-Assad must go. Are you, do you mean that or don't you? That's what is, that's when it gets difficult. And candidly, to a degree, we had that on Afghanistan uh, in that period uh, as well, where, gosh, we thought, you know, okay, we're really, we're gonna do this thing, we're gonna see it through, uh, but to announce in the speech where you announce the buildup, the date by which you're gonna draw down? I mean, what does this tell the enemy? So again, these are the issues, I think, that statesmen have to come to grips with. And I think did ultimately in the Balkans when you were uh, in, in your positions. And, uh, and ultimate, but it took how long for us to do that? And maybe back in 19, was it 91, if we just bombed the Serbs in the very beginning, would they have continued? Um, a lot of, certainly my old boss, General Galvin, the Sakir, thought they would not have, but we did not do it. Um, and the consequences then were four or five years of very serious civil war uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and particularly then the subsequent uh, actions elsewhere. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, on that note, I regret we are entirely out of time. We, we could have spent the whole afternoon, and I know you have many other things to do. So I'm just going to hand back to Johan to close out our session. Well, thank you, Richard. Well, that was uh, amazing. I think um, you all here share that view. And uh, let's give them a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.